Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Welcome to a new kind of video that I want to do. I recently had an idea that I wanted to make a video revolving around embalming. I figured why not go through some like interesting facts, history and today wise, of embalming and see what your guys' opinions are because I thought these were really interesting and I doubt most of you know these things so I wanted to share and if you like this type of content don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, turn on the notification bells and don't forget to follow all of my social media in the description box below and let's get into the video. Oh my god, I'm sorry if you see this uh, mark on my face. I literally was like just shaving off the hairs here from my eyebrows with my little eyebrow razor and I guess it went a bit too hard so I'm sorry if that's distracting I wasn't expecting that but anyways let's get back to the video the way that I have it set up here is I have it from like history to today and it's pretty much all around the world things so it's not like any particular culture or country that has these specific practices and I went through and I found all of these from the internet and I picked out the most interesting one and I'm putting it all into my own words so it is not counted as plagiarism so I've worded everything into my own words here and some of them they're not in my own words but it's just like standard procedure like it's not like you can plagiarize instruction anyways let's begin with the history portion here so first we'll start off with the definition of embalming which is to preserve the body from decay, usually by arterial injection with a preserva preservation chemical. So that's the definition of embalming. So also like mummifying, just trying to preserve the deceased, right? First thing that I came across here that I thought was pretty interesting. I'm also just going to be reading out from my notes here because I do not have the time to memorize that all. So it says... During the Middle Ages, European royalty were embalmed by doctors. By the 16th century, the body would, would be washed, infused with herbs and spices like lavender and thyme and dehydrated with powders and ointments. The body or the body part would then be wrapped in layers of wax cloth, sealed with beeswax and placed in a lead coffin or urn. Given the rarity of working with organic materials, it would naturally disintegrate after death, which I thought was pretty cool and interesting, but they definitely don't do that anymore. Like doctors are never even close to that. They are just the ones that like pronounce the person dead and then the embalmers and all the other people take care of the rest. The second interesting fact that I have here, uh, it says the Persians and the Babylonians, as well as others, preserved the body by submerging it in honey or wax. And I was like, dude, I don't know what that would have done. <laughs> like, this is obviously in the history, but like, I just don't know how honey or wax would have preserved a decaying body. <laughs> Third interesting note I have here is in the 18th and 19th centuries, there was a shortage of legally acquired bodies to dissect and study. So at the time, the anatomists could only use the bodies of convicted criminals for study and without proper preservation, the bodies became unusable after a short period of time. The next interesting fact that I have here is because there weren't enough legal bodies to supply all the doctors and medical schools with, a black market opportunity arose resurrectionists or body snatchers as they called them began to steal newly buried bodies and sell them it caused much pain and suffering for the surviving family members so to combat against body snatching some families even hired guards or installed metal crates or gates to protect the grave of the deceased i thought that was really interesting because like i can't imagine that happening now you know what i mean like Literally, I'm pretty sure you would go to jail if you ever did something like that now. The next thing that I have here says, the back then, a dead body was not considered anyone's property, which is why its removal was only or often only a misdemeanor. 
However, dissecting on illegally acquired corpse with or came with heavier consequences. This meant that the, both body snatchers and the medical professionals would face consequences if discovered. It wasn't considered property back then, so I don't know, like, human aren't property, but the remaining, I guess it is property. I don't know how I feel on that, but I thought that was pretty interesting. The next one that I have here says, During the Middle Ages of Western Europe, people feared that a deceased person's spirit could rise later to haunt or harm the living. So to prevent this, morticians were in charge of decapitating the deceased at or as a preventative safety measure. For those who had committed suicide, more drastic measures were taken. A mortician would thrust a stake through the deceased's heart at midnight. And I'm like, holy shiitake mushrooms. This shit was like violent back then. I don't think the dead are going to come back to haunt you. Like, they are at peace. They don't want to be bothered. You know what I mean? The next cool thing I thought this was interesting. They said Abraham Lincoln was the first president to be embalmed. It's pretty interesting. I never knew that. So a majority of embalming took place at the residence of the deceased. That's another one. That's kind of creep to me. Like imagine, like how would you even do that? Because now everybody has like prep rooms where they have all the machines and the tools that you need to like do a full embalming. So it's like, what would you hook all these things up to? Like, what did that look like? I'm so interested to know, you know what I mean? Now we're gonna move on to today's. The first step is called arterial embalming. So this involves the injection of embalming chemicals into the blood vessels. Blood and other flu fluids are displaced by this injection and are expelled from the right jugular vein. This process and the fluids that are displaced are collectively referred to as draining. The second step is called cavity embalming, which refers to the replacement of the body's internal fluids with embalming chemicals. During this part of the process, the embalmer makes a small incision just above the navel and pushes a surgical instrument called a trocar into the chest and stomach cavities. This punctures the hollow organs and allows their liquid contents to be drained. Then cavities are then filled with the chemicals that contain formaldehyde so literally just ripping up everything letting it drain out and then fill up with the chemical then the third step is called hypodermic embalming this is a supplemental method that is used as needed depending on the individual body a needle is used to treat areas where preserving fluid was not successfully distributed in the body during the main arterial injection so that means like any area that didn't get filled up with the uh, chemical fluid you just put a needle in and then squirt in some formaldehyde and then it just fills up that finger or area that didn't get filled up during the original process. So the fourth and final step is called the surface embalming. This is another supplemental method conducted as needed that uses embalming chemicals to preserve and rest restore areas directly on the skin surface. This method is usually more necessary if there is excessive skin damage, usually from an accident, illness, or decomposition. So that was like the main steps on how embalming is done for the actual injection part. And then here are some other interesting facts that I thought were pretty cool. It says the Jewish and the Muslim traditions both consider embalming to be taboo since bodies are supposed to return to the earth pure. And I understand this because when my grandmother died, she was Jewish and she went to a Jewish cemetery and had a graveside burial and they, she was not embalmed and I remember listening to my mom talk to her sister because like there was three sisters so my mom and then two other sisters and they were talking about how they can't embalm her because of the Jewish religion apparently Jews are only to be buried and not allowed to be cremated because of the Holocaust which makes a lot of sense I choose to be buried as well but I don't choose that because of the Jewish religion. I just don't want to be cremated. It says, embalming is also environmentally costly. An average of 800,000 gallons of formaldehyde are buried in the ground each year, enough to fill 1.2 Olympic-sized swimming pools. 
Formaldehyde is a highly toxic and flammable chemical that has actually been classified by the Environmental Protection Agency as a probable human carcinogen. I thought that was really interesting of how much formaldehyde is being used. Like, did you know that? I didn't know that. So the next one I have here is the cost range anywhere from $500 to $1,300 and typically cover the process itself, dressing and cosmetology. And I'm like, bruh, if it's that much, why are the embalmers only getting paid $20 an hour? The next one. In addition to formaldehyde, some funeral homes now offer green embalming, which is involving using an embalming fluid made from non-toxic chemicals and essential oils. The next one that I got here, the embalmer must repair donor and autopsy body. The next cool interesting fact that I have here is most European countries, it's not even allowed, but for environmental reasons, and the allow and to allow sufficient decomposition as graves are commonly reused after a period of time refrigerating the body is common while visitations are still possible and common only in very very recent years a light form of embalming is allowed called thanatoxy i don't know how to say that word T-H-A-N-A-T-O-P-R-A-X-I-E. That's what it says. Still, even that is quite uncommon today. So I thought that was pretty interesting. A study has demonstrated the carcinogenic effects of formaldehyde and concluded that embalmers are more susceptible to cancer, heart disease, and pneumonia because of all those fumes in the air. Now, I want to get into some planning I guess like it's not like you have to do it it's just like here's some tips of what you want to get in order if you want to start planning for your funeral so that other people don't have to handle all that stuff for you and possibly give you what you don't want and you could have prevented that you know what I mean for the first thing that I have on my list here this is also known as estate planning because you are documenting your wishes regarding medical care and how your money, property, and valuables will be distributed upon your death. End of life planning documents include living trust allows you to manage your estate and assets while you are living. Living will ensures your wishes about medical decisions will be followed in the event you become incapacitated and unable to express them on your own. Last will and testament. Legal document that details how your assets should be handled and who is responsible for your dependents when you pass away. The power of attorney provisions. So this is what my mom had to go through, like literally because my grandmother had left so much. <laughs> These are legal documents that must be drawn up by an attorney and include healthcare, POA, durable medical, POA, healthcare proxy, and durable POA for finances. And by completing these forms, you are appointing someone to make legal, financial, medical, or business decisions on your behalf if you die or become incapacitated. Organ tissue donor designation. These forms specify that you want your organs and tissue donated upon your death. Domestic partnership agreement. This form is used to declare legal rights and responsibilities for a long-term partnership which I think is important if you have a husband or a wife. Decide between a will and a trust. A trust protects you, your loved ones, and your legacy once you are gone. Trusts are not just for the wealthy. Anyone who owns property or assets valued at or above 160 k should consider a trust to avoid the painful and lengthy po probate process, which is exactly what my mom had to go through for her mom's dad. A will is your written declaration about who should receive your assets upon your death. It also states that you have chosen to take the responsi responsibility for your minor children. If you are not ready to set up a trust, a will is a good place to start. Wills and trusts can be modified at any time and should be reviewed annually. Next one, list your assets. Assets are the possessions you want passed down to your heirs. These items can include savings and checking accounts, cash, CDs, treasury bills, 
uh, real estate and land, investments, stocks and bonds, pensions and retirement plans, life insurance policies, art and collectibles, jewelry and corporate assets if you own a business. The next one, when you fail to plan your funeral or memorial service, the responsibility falls on the shoulders of a loved one who may not know all of your likes and dislikes. This means that your casket may be surrounded by yellow roses when you hated yellow roses. So like this is a good reason why you want to get everything in like in place and set up, right? And some other cool interesting facts I have here is um they have different ways of like suturing and like sewing and gluing back together. So one thing that I thought that was interesting is they used denture adhesive to put skulls back together. And I'm like, dude, that's so interesting. But it makes sense because they're so strong. The dentures are used to like be really stuck there, right? So I thought that was interesting. And then another interesting fact that I thought they say decapitations are not fun. It involves a lot of stitching and wax. I'm sure it's very time consuming to do the decapitations because you have to make sure it looks perfect and then also preserve the head itself. I wanted to go through some choices of funerals that you had as options. So the first set I'm gonna go through is the funerals. So there's a traditional service which is a full funeral service that often happens in a church or funeral home. The next one is a viewing and visitation, which involves an open casket when possible, so friends and family can say their goodbyes during a prearranged time frame. Another one is a wake, and that is a gathering that happens in a home prior to a formal service. And another one is memorial service, and that is a gathering that happens after a burial or cremation. So the next one, a celebration of life, a type of memorial service that honors the deceased by celebrating their life. So that's literally like if you go to a chapel or something and you're just like there and it's not a party, but it's just a gathering with all of your loved ones talking about the good memories of the person, but the body's not actually present. Next one that's available is committal or graveside service. So that is a brief gathering that occurs after a funeral and involves prayers and flowers. And the last one is scattering of ashes. So a formal or informal ceremony that takes place after a loved one has been cremated. And here are some different burial options. So the burial options, number one, in ground, which is a loved one is laid to rest in a cemetery. So that's literally what my grandmother had. So the next kind is a public or private mausoleum. So one's body or ashes is placed within an above ground structure that houses several bodies or cremated remains. And I believe that's something that the royals are uh, put in once they die, like the Queen of England and Prince Philip. I believe that's what they were uh, done like that's what was done with their bodies um, the next one lawn crypt which is an above ground structure that houses only one or two bodies uh, or cremated remains so the next one everybody knows cremation the process of disposing of the body by reducing it to ashes through combustion so another one burial at sea involves releasing a body or ashes into the ocean from a boat how cool is that? I thought that was really interesting. This next one, the green or natural burial, which is method that is gaining in popularity because it allows the body to naturally recycle into the earth through decomposition. I really think that's the new way to go because like imagine all of the coffins out of the whole world over the billions of years that the world has been around. Like, can you imagine? Another interesting fact that I wanted to bring up was embalmed bodies cannot be placed directly into the ground because the toxic chemicals will leach into the environment. However, the caskets that hold the bodies also pose environmental problems. So modern caskets are not eco-friendly because they are resource heavy due to metal and precious woods that are used in their designs. I'm going to go through some last 
steps here on how to comfort the loss of someone who is grieving. The best ways to comfort someone who is suffering a loss would be, number one, let them know you're there to listen by providing them with an open invitation to call or stop by anytime they want to talk. Number two, offer to help in practical ways. If you are going to the store, ask if you can pick up anything for them. Offer to help with chores or lawn maintenance. And number three, Getting them out of the house for a change for, of scenery is important. Initiate this by asking if you can treat them to lunch or dinner or just coffee. Even if they reject the initial offer, they will appreciate the invitation and take you up on it when they feel like it. Be sure to keep in touch with them and invite them again and sometime after some time has passed. Number four, suggest helping them create a scrapbook or digital legacy of their deceased loved one. This is a great way to celebrate the life they lived and enjoy reminiscing about the good times through photos and letters. Number five, which is the last one. Being there for a grief-stricken person is a huge part in helping them heal from the pain of a loss from, simply by letting them know they are not alone. If a holiday or important date is approaching, such as an anniversary or decedent's birthday, make sure the grieving person is not alone on this day. That is all the interesting facts and tips that I had for today about embalming and what I have learned so far. If you enjoyed that video, don't forget to leave a like, comment, share, subscribe, turn on the notification bells, and don't forget to follow all my social media in the description box below. And don't forget to treat people the way you want to be treated because that's how you get far in life. And I will see you guys in my next video. Peace out.